good morning, afternoon, and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the ACNS webinars. The speaker for the second session today is Prof. Amit Tapa, and his lecture is on endoscopic intracranial hematoma evacuation, challenges and solutions. Prof. Tapa is the head of the department Neurological Surgery at the Kathmandu Medical College Teaching Hospital, Kathmandu. He is the Vice President of the Nepali Society of Neurosurgeons and Nepal Epilepsy Society. He is the part chairperson and founding treasurer of the Neurospine Chapter of Nissan. He is a note author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals and was also the past editor-in-chief of the Nepal Journal of Neuroscience. We are extremely grateful to have him for accepting our invitation uh, for the second session today. We would like to uh, invite Prof. Uh, Amit Tapa to continue on with his talk for the night. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sam. Uh, is my screen uh, visible? Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, see. Okay, thank you. Actually, um, I was not supposed to give this talk, but then Somehow, because of some emergency situation, our speaker has to, uh, to leave for, for the emergency work. Uh, so I decided to, to present on endoscopic intracranial hematoma evacuation because I realized that this technique is still not being adapted by most of these surgeons um, all over the world. And even though the outcome is far, uh, what I will be actually discussing in both literature as well as uh, through my own uh, experiences. Uh, well, I have uh, nothing in significant or commercially related to this presentation. This whole talk is only on academic uh, exchange. So uh, depending on our studies, uh, what finding we have realized in Nepal per se is that uh, even though only 15% of the old acute stroke has been uh, documented to be because of uh, hematomes, hemorrhages, in Nepal over the last 20 years in our studies, we have found that they have a significant rise in hemorrhagic component as compared to ischemic stroke. And the median mortality rate uh, in, in our place of the world is almost 40%, uh, which is fairly high. And that's why uh, uh, this was very important for us to devise a method of uh, proper management of these patients. And even those patients who survive, they have high morbidity and they pose a greater burden to the families. And this becomes very much important, and particularly in the developing countries like ours, where the bed and knife in case becomes ill, then, it be then the whole family becomes uh, depredent. Now, we all know that the mechanism of intracranial hemorrhage, it, uh, how it causes brain injury, is just not related to the direct pressure of an acute expanding mass lesion because of the local compression of immediate uh, surrounding brain tissue or widespread mechanical injury because of raised ICP, hydrocephalus, or herniation, but also because of secondary physiological and cellular pathways, which are triggered by hematoma and its metabolized blood products, leading to cerebral edema, inflammation, and biochemical toxicity of hemoglobin, iron, and thrombin. Uh, what has also been shown that the early hematoma expansion by its mechanical sharing of surrounding vessels by, uh, of its volume is a constant predictor of worse ICH outcome. And uh, to add to this, uh, um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the problem, we do not have any major medical therapy uh, for as an effective management, uh, besides uh, some medical therapy to control the blood pressure for reversal of anticoagulation, which are aimed at limiting the hematoma expansion. Uh, henceforth, we are actually left without any uh, armitarium, very effective armitarium for controlling of this particular mechanism of ICH-related brain injury. If you see the current practice guideline, uh, which has been published in 2022 by American Heart Association in the Journal of Stroke, uh, which actually talks about uh, the, the recommendation for use of renotomy for supratentorial hemorrhages, the if, if effect of uh, uh, renotomy for supratentorial hemorrhage on mortality is uh, still uncertain. And similarly, when we are talking about cranectomy for ICH, still the, out, uh, the effect on its functional outcome is uncertain. So the both if, uh, uh, benefit of cranectomy and cranectomy is still uncertain on the effect of mortality. However, what this recommendation talks about is that minimal invasive approaches for evacuation of supratentorial ICH and intraventricular hemorrhage, as compared with the medical management alone, have demonstrated a reduction in mortality. Now, this creates this particular guideline actually creates a role of minimal invasive approaches, which has been supported by various uh, randomized clinical trials and RCTs. And thenceforth, mis-evacuation for 
intracranial hemorrhage has not only been shown to reduce mortality, but has also been shown to have a better uh, functional outcome over the conventional cranotomy. And if in case it is associated with intraventricular hemorrhage, then neuroendoscopy together with IVD plus spinal thrombolysis is now being prescribed by the various guidelines. Now, when we talk of endoscopic hematoma evacuation, the question may come up, why endoscopically? Well, it is a minimal invasive access to deep-seated hematoma. It can provide you a direct image or visual guidance. We can look on the side as well as the depth. And because of the continuous irrigation, the clot tends to disintegrate, dissolve, and flush, and the water actually flushes out the clot. And this procedure can also be done under local anesthesia in case the patient is awake and cooperative. And besides, it relieves the hematoma evaluation volume and also reduces the perihematoma edema because of the persistent hematoma in the cavity. Now, this endoscopic hematoma evacuation has been attempt attempted by two different ways, either by using a tube, which is also known as endoscopic assisted uh, surgeries, or by a direct endoscopy where we use a water irrigation system, as we'll be talking in my presentation. So the benefit of direct endoscopic approaches has been that the water acts to wash the clot and, and also maintain hemostasis. The water creates a space for the work, and that's why it protects the brain from the suction. It protects the brain from cavity distortion and also protects the brain from excessive relaxation, which has been seen to cause subdural bleed, particularly when we are using a tube. Also, it provides a good vision for hemostasis. And uh, from our practical classes in the lab, we must have realized that the water actually provides a good magnification for the vision. And this procedure, if in case, can be performed through a burr hole and the and local anesthesia can also be doable. It causes minimal trauma and the benefit of endoscopic vision, as we'll be talking in my further slides, is very much better. And because of the water, there's no fogging of the scope, which is being seen in the dry, in the dry media. So is it better than the stereotactic aspiration? Well, the study which uh, has been published in Frontier Neurology has, has actually analyzed 258 patients. And uh, what they found that uh, the stereotactic, uh, stereotactic aspiration group as well as supercranotomy group had a higher mortality as compared to the endoscopic evacuation, evacuation group. And that's why they actually concluded that endoscopic evacuation significantly decreases the six months mortality in patients with hemorrhage with more than 40 ml, as well as GCS of less than 8. Well, we do not have any direct comparison in terms of morbidity, but then if we see the meta-analysis, which uses the MIST-3 uh, patient uh, group, um, it actually suggests that there is significant association between the extent of the clot removal and the mortality, uh, if in case it is achieved uh, properly. And also in the CLEAR-3 trial group, it has been shown that if in case we can achieve a near complete clot removal, these patients have far better functional benefit. If in case the near complete uh, it's, uh, evacuation has been defined as more than 85% of the IVH volume. Now, our protocol in my center had been uh, to, to use this procedure only for those uh, deep-seated hematoma, which is more than 20 mils and has been associated with a rise in ICP or clinical duration. Uh, deep-seated, by, by definition, should mean that the clot uh, uh, depth from the surface should be more than one centimeter and it is supratentially located. Uh, plus minus extension to the ventricles and plus minus associated to the hydrocephalus. Initially, we wanted to uh, do this procedure only for those patients who GCS is between 9 to 12 because less than 8, we used to go for decompressive connectomy associated to it. But now, after getting good results, we have actually expanded our um, indications to even GCS of 9. And we used to do this procedure within 72 hours of ictus. Uh, better would be to do as soon as possible. Uh, so there are four core operative tenets which we always follow when we are doing a direct endoscopic evacuation of hematoma. The first and the foremost is minimal brain manipulation uh, and also to minimize the cavity distortion and to obtain and maintain the hemostasis and to have an intraoperative evaluation of completeness of evacuation, which I will be discussing in detail. So how we go through the hematoma is that we always make a target. The target is the center of the hematoma and the entry area is the cocker's point, which is one to two centimeter anterior to the coronal suture and the mid superior line, uh, or also can be defined by an 11 centimeter positive from the clavula or three to four centimeter later from the midline. However, we always uh, try to keep the trajectory along the late longest axis of the hematoma uh, so that the cavity distortion is minimum. Uh, so whenever we are going into it, if in case there are, uh, the hematoma is actually going into different uh, cavities, then we can actually plan multiple trajectories, but that the injury area remains the same. 
So the navigation actually adds up to a value. We can actually plan it before we go into the patient and also we can uh, see how the instruments is going inside. So before we had the navigation system, we used ultrasound guided. For the ultrasound guided method, we had to make little bit little uh, small clinotomy. But the benefit of the ultrasound had been that it uh, can help us to mark the center. It gauges the depth of the surface and also the direction of the endoscope and the completeness of the procedure can be um, uh, can be asserted. So ultrasound was a very good method of uh, doing this procedure. Now, when we use ultrasound, uh, we use to make us mini uh, a mini craniotomy in that cases. Uh, so, because the foot um, area of the probe would not set into a small butt hole. Uh, however, this procedure had helped us in many patients. Only thing is that we used to make a beveled margins at the edges so that the uh, crino, the endoscope can go on the other sides. Uh, so, when we are using ultrasound guided, so this is the size of the hemat of the crinotomy you can see in the post op images. Uh, so, this is how it looks like when with the, the endoscope is inside the hematoma. So, thick cloth on the surface, and then we can evacuate it with the suction. And then the patients did have a very good recovery, and we usually used to put a leaf and EVD catheter inside so that the residual cavity can also be sucked out. So, we can have a good output, and the patients also can become much better much earlier. Uh, so, how we are suctioning this uh, this clot? So, we use uh, the irrigation media of normal saline, which is kept at 15 centimeter height. So, the 15 centimeter height has been kept so that uh, from the trigger, so that the ICP does not goes out. We do not lose any pressure pump. So, just by the height of 15 centimeter, we allow the water to flow in. Uh, so this also gives an idea that whenever the water stops flowing inside the cavity, we know that either our tube is in inside the normal brain or the pressure inside the brain is higher. So in that way, we always keep the channel of exit, the exiting saline open so that the ICP does not go up. Uh, <clears throat> and then we use a pressure regulator device um, like this. So we use uh, we keep our suction uh, attached to it so we can actually reduce the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the negative suction or we can increase it, but we try not to go it very high. And so whenever we come up to a clot, then we just insert the suction tube, that is the infant feeding tube, then French, uh, into the into the particular clot, and then we suck it, and then uh, again we do we change the uh, endoscope, and then we see what we are doing. And the whole idea is not to suck over the brain surface and to uh, suck directly over the clot. <clears throat> so this is how we keep on doing it, and then we realize that uh, after we remove a substantial amount of clot, uh, the cavity starts opening up, and the whole area becomes uh, less bloody, and then the whole vision becomes very clear. Um, so, and then we can also identify the cavity. So, uh, this was our pilot study we did, and we finished it in 2020. Uh, we had an outcome variable of hematoma evacuation rate, operative time, intraoperative blood loss, plasma outcome scale at discharge in six months right after the search in hospital stay. And we had a beautiful results um, from both pre and post op analysis of various patients, where the patients uh, did have a very, a very significant hematoma evacuation and also very early recovery. And in this non infinity study, uh, we did we concluded that the endoscopic surgery had similar outcomes compared to that of microscopic hematoma evacuation in terms of operative time, intraoperative blood loss, Glasgow outcome scale at discharge and at six months, uh, together with the less tissue trauma, which is not associated, which is usually associated with the, with the craniotomies. Well, uh, the whole story is actually going around the endoscope. So the, the endoscope, which had been, we have been using, is basically an Aspolep invent. The beauty of this scope is that it has a wider channel for a working port. And then uh, we have uh, a 30 degree scope, which can actually look on the side and much better. So, and this endoscope has helped us to evacuate in a lot of patients. And uh, <clears throat> we usually use a pneumatic arm to fix the, uh, the scope because we do not do it uh, freehand. And after the navigation has uh, come into our, into our, our material, it has helped a lot because it now had make uh, the things much more faster. Uh, and then we can even do this procedure through a small burr hole, which just allows to fit our endoscope into. Uh, so this is how it looks like the setup after the, uh, the whole setup is, cre is, it's, uh, is attached with the navigation system and the pneumatic arm. So we go directly into the cap, into the midpoint of the of the hematoma, and then we start uh, sucking it with the with the suction tube under um, a graduated or a monitored suction, 
and as soon as we see the cavity and whenever we enter the ventricle we have to be wary about the uh, core plexus so whenever we see that we stop our procedure and then we, we just uh, inspect the cavities and come out uh, and then usually we leave our drain inside uh, so that anything which is there inside particularly the water should come out and the, uh, we can also measure the icp through this tube in the post operative period for the last two periods we have also been um, fortunate enough to have a cranial robot a stealth order guide system in our place so we're using robotic guidance uh, the the benefit of using a robotic guidance is that it is very fast to reach to the hematoma and um, the robotic movements uh, actually make it very much precise so this is how we are using the robot these days uh, so after the patient's head is fixed uh, we can use the robot to uh, come to a trajectory point and then um, we can actually guide the whole procedure under visual as well as uh, under the uh, navigation guidance uh, to evacuate the hematoma and to get the um, uh, the ICP control at the earliest. Um, these days, we are also trying to do a local anesthetic procedure. This is done after the skull block is done, uh, skull block is given, and then we are fixing the skull again. And then under navigation system, we are doing the procedure. Uh, we never attempt this procedure in a freehand system. We never do this procedure without fixing the head. The only problem is that whenever the scope is inside, the patient moves their head and if the whole thing is gone, uh, the patient can be in trouble. So we do not allow it. Uh, and option number two is uh, using EM navigation, but that again, this procedure has to be under GA so the patient is not moving um, um, by per se. So desirable but not widely available is the scuba technique using a polar device. This is a, a, um, a system which is very uh, similar to uh, uh, to Accusa, which actually morselates the clot and sucks through it. So this was uh, published in 2018, and it's a very good device, uh, but the only thing is, is the cost factor and the viability in our area. So till the time it is not available, I think uh, this method of uh, endoscopic uh, guided uh, hematoma suctioning or evacuation is much better. So the challenges uh, had been that we do have a limitation of biomagnetic manipulation uh, in the present endoscope. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that the evacuation of the hematoma had been substantial so that we should we should actually inspect the cavity before we come out. Uh, and then uh, we should be uh, very much aware of the fact that by our irrigation can increase the hematoma, the intracranial uh, renal pressure. So we should be very much aware of this fact. So we should be not allowing the, the water to stay inside the brain and then try to try to see that the brain is not pulsating out through that small bar hole. And also there are difficulty in removing large clots. Uh, so we try to irrigate it as much as possible. If in case, uh, the, some of, in some cases of mine, uh, there are the big clots and uh, particularly this is seen when we are operating on the day third, the clot has become much more thicker or firmer. So in those cases, we have to do a mechanical um, um, uh, lysis of the clot by using a grasper. Uh, but then um, this is done very selectively in those patients where we know that we are inside the clot and not over into with the brain. Uh, Post-evacuation brain swelling had been our fear, but then we have not seen a single case in our, in our uh, series. Uh, we have been able to achieve a very good uh, uh, um, brain relaxation after the procedure. And this is very, very important. Uh, to, close, to, uh, to see once we are ending our surgery, to see that the brain has actually gone down uh, and then uh, the brain swelling is not up. So if in case the brain swelling is up, then the patient should go for an immediate CT scan so that we can plan for a cranotomy or for the procedure accordingly. Uh, so post-operative formation of blood clot can occur. So we have to be um, very much cognizant of the blood pressure monitoring. Uh, the, these patients do have bleeding or brain swelling, particularly the brain, uh, the blood pressure is not controlled. In our scenario, the major cause is hypertensive bleed. So we have to control the blood pressure in all these patients uh, meticulously. And then difficulty in hemostasis in some patients uh, have been seen. And what we do in these cases is that we do a persistent endoscopic lavage. Uh, so that actually keeps on the hematoma or the bleeding in the control. If in case the bleeding is from an artery and cannot be controlled through an, uh, through an endoscopic lavage, then we go for endoscopic pottery or by using a radiofrequency plasma. Now, radiofrequency plasma, which uh, the, uh, the spine surgery uses, uh, are much more bigger. So they cannot go through an endoscope. So what we have done in those cases is that we have actually used uh, uh, an, an ENT or laryngeal probe uh, for that matter. These are very thin probes and can be easily navigated through the port. And uh, as you can see in, in my video, in one of my case series, that we can actually use it to 
to uh, to uh, calculate the arterial bleeders, and then of course we can do a mechanical compression by using um, uh, uh, a, a microcotinoid or by using a gel foam for these cases, if in case they are do not complete. Now there are certain knowledge gaps definitely uh, in the literature. When we see of MIS approaches for IC, ICH, there are various heterogeneous methods, and henceforth the literature does not talk about what particular. Uh, uh, devices or uh, things are used. Say, for example, in ICEH study where the, uh, they have used this Apollo devices, um, the devices, uh, the same devices may not be used in other endoscopic procedures so that the literature cannot compare uh, apples to apples in that sense. Also, the current evidences does not support specific recommendations for which patients to be selected for surgery. And the optical time to surgical treatment to endoscopic approach also remains to be evaluated. And the functional outcome benefit is still deb debatable. Henceforth, we need to do a lot of uh, research in this and a lot of documentations uh, um, in, in this particular area. So to conclude, uh, the recent guidelines do favor endoscopic approaches over conservative care. Uh, endoscopic interventions compared with the crinotomy uh, have uh, uh, far better functional outcomes. And endoscopic interventions uh, does require surgeons and center skills and experience, and that's what uh, it has to be trained. Uh, as Dr. Sukumar in the previous slide has been talking about, as has, has spoken about how to develop your skills uh, by going into various conferences uh, and attending the workshops and uh, and then assisting some surgeons into various procedures. Uh, this particular step-by-step -step method of uh, developing your skills helps a lot as well as endoscopic hematoma as evacuations are safe and it provides an excellent way to evacuate spontaneous hematoma. Well, uh, thank you for your patience listening and I will be happy to take any other questions. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, I have done uh, endoscopic uh, ICH removals, but uh, via the dry method, uh, not using the endoscope directly, um, mainly because I've tried that and I guess the working channel is too small and it takes forever to suck out the clot. Um, so may I ask, uh, in your scope, how, how do you actually suck out the clot uh, in a timely manner? Uh, you presented that your working channel is bigger. Is that the, the secret to it? Um, so maybe this is my first question. Uh, my next question uh, would be the selection criteria for the patients. Uh, it say, you say that uh, just go from 9 to 12, uh, but I think a lot of times I have patients where the GCS is 14, 13, 14, uh, with obvious weakness, with a clot size of maybe 25 cm cube. Uh, would you consider doing endoscopic surgery for this type of patients? Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you, Sam, for the question. Uh, coming to the first question, so what uh, we did was uh, uh, this is scope like uh, Ascolab Minop Invent. Uh, they have a wider bore, so they do allow a ten French uh, infant feeding tube to go inside it. So what we do is we hit the clot bank head on, and then we take the endoscope out and then push in this uh, infant feeding tube to the length of the tube. We do not go into the center. We just remain inside the, the tube. And then we attach it to the uh, to the uh, negative suction and then suck the clot out in a rotatory fashion. So when we rotate the cloth, the cloth is sucked inside the tube and it is sucked out. And it also, the, the sheath uh, actually starts morselating or rather it actually creates a clot uh, dissection. And that's how we can take the, the cloth safely out. And then as soon as we start, we take the, the clot out, we again push in the endoscope and the, the suction is ongoing, the irrigation is ongoing. Uh, so we can now look for another clot and then start sucking it that way. Uh, so this, this is how we do it sequentially. So it takes time and we need to be patient. Uh, we cannot jump to remove every clot. Uh, so we have to do a very sequential manner. Now coming to the second question of uh, the, the 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 criteria of the uh, selection. So we take uh, out the hematoma if only the hematoma size is more than 20 mils. And uh, we try to keep the uh, GCS criteria between uh, five to 12 at the present moment of my practice. Uh, 14 GCS, uh, I won't prescribe the surgery to every patient. Unless until we see that the patient is uh, functionally uh, uh, much more severely debilitated. Say, for example, if the patient uh, power is uh, 1 by 5 or 0 by 5, 
we have in our past experiences found that the patient's power actually improves very fast if in case the hematoma is removed. So patient can be uh, functionally mobilized much more earlier. Uh, but then we do not have a literature to support it. So we do discuss with our family members that, okay, we have an option to with them, but then this is not uh, uh, scientifically proven. We do not have an evidences to show you on paper, but then this is something which we have found and there are certain experiences which we had. Uh, so that is something which is an option given to the patients, but we do not uh, uh, suggest to every patient, definitely. Thank, thank you. That means uh, using a time French feeding tube and yeah. uh, indications if there, there's severe weakness and then discussion with family for, for the second question. Okay, thank you so much. I think Prof Nair wants to ask a question. Oh, it's a very excellent talk because a very... It, it may not be innovative, but uh, it is very useful technique because uh, you know, the, uh, as I said earlier, this collateral damage when you do an open craniotomy uh, is uh, something uh, uh, is devastating. So my question is, uh, when you do, okay, because you have a selection criteria that is between nine and less than nine, so uh, are we put this endoscope in a brain which is tense, that is the ICP is raised. So uh, after evacuation of hematoma, uh, sometimes you may need a, a decompressive craniotomy. That means even after doing enough decompression, the brain may not be relaxed and the ICP is raised. That is my first question. Second question, when you are keeping the endoscope inside the brain, uh, and you remove the hematoma, if the pressure is high, the brain will fall into the brain or the surrounding tissue will fall into the area of evacuation of the hematoma. So will it create a problem when you are doing this endoscopic removal of the hematoma? I think I, you understood my question. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you again for your questions. And in fact, these are very relevant questions and uh, these needs to be answered. And that's why our selection criteria was very strict to begin with. And I'm, try, I'm slowly expanding the criteria just after looking at my data and how my experience has gone through. I, I accept this is not an innovative technique. In fact, uh, there's nothing to innovate now in, in medicine and surgery right? because most of our seniors have already done uh, uh, like uh, excellent work in the past. And we are trying to uh, like uh, adapt many other procedures in our local scenario where these uh, facilities or gadgets may not be available or too expensive to afford. Uh, coming to your first questions regarding the, the, the swollen brain. So what we have found is that the patient GCS is less than eight chances of brain edema is very, very high. So that's why when we started our procedure, we took the patients with GCS of more than eight, that is nine to 12. In that cases, we found that the intracranial hematoma volume was the major factor for the patient's brain swelling. So the moment the hematoma had was evacuated, the liquid stuff used to come out initially. So the ICP starts going down. And as I told in my presentation, when we are keeping the, the water irrigation at the height of 15 centimeter from the tragus, if the ICP is high, uh, the water doesn't go inside the brain. So we are not doing any additional damage to the patient. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, and then uh, I have in my experience found that once the hematoma is substantially removed, the brain starts relaxing down. Now what water does it that it actually avoids the distortion of the cavity. So when the, water, the cavity starts getting evacuated of the clot, the water is filling the space. And that's why it keeps the brain in its own position. So it does not allow the brain to fall. Now, this is the problem which I realized with the tube evacuation of the hematoma. When the, when you're doing an air media, the, the cavity actually falls inside the, the wall. It starts actually collapsing inside the cavity. And that causes more injury, more bleeding. And then the whole thing is just starts distorting. And then sometimes your clot may be hidden in one of the nooks and the corners. So those clots cannot be evacuated. So if you see my post-operative images, you could see that uh, uh, the major substantial hematoma was actually evacuated. The, the reason which I found was that the clots did not have the ability or the, the spaces to go and, uh, and, and get hidden because the water is expanding it and that's why it, everything starts getting float, uh, float and come to the uh, suction which is, being in, uh, which is being provided. So that's how the water actually plays a vital role. It, uh, it not only washes, but also dissects the clot and also helps me to find out uh, these small clots which are uh, hiding somewhere. So we do not have to chase to the clot. 
we, we just have to morselate and break the clot and then take it out and then the whole starts the, the whole clot starts coming out um uh, i think i've answered your question if in case uh, if there's anything please ask here yes yes you have you, you, you had a, a excellent uh, uh, way of uh, making us understand what you you are doing uh, and uh, uh, i understood what you said uh, but it's a very excellent technique but my one of my questions is even after you are doing this uh, evacuation and you find that there is some increased pressure inside that patient may need a decompressive craniotomy how will you identify those subsections but as you said if it is a gcs 8 9 that you mean you you think that this patient will have an icp not very high so that the evacuation hematoma will reduce the icp but in certain That's patient true. even a, so how will you know that you, you, some a subset of patient very few patients you have excellent technique yeah. and i agree to your many of your points because if you evacuate a hematoma the recovery will be better that is, even if it is a anecdotal you are uh, from your experience we are also experienced a patient uh, with a hematoma uh, a plus minus case for evacuation if you do evacuation he will have a better post operative point so uh, if it is a it's very high after this uh, it's a subset of patient that have to be undergone decompressive craniotomy after endoscopy and do you have any your your own techniques to identify what are those oh yes uh, so so if in case uh, i see that the hematoma volume is not substantial say for example it's not more than 30 mils or 40 mils but still the patient gcs is very poor and patient has come up uh, say for example two or three days after the the, the hemorrhagic stroke which is very usual in our scenario because patients are being referred from many places and they've come to our place maybe after 48 hours 72 hours now these patients are not good patients for endoscopic hematoma patients because by that time the patient's edema has already generated and the hematoma may not be the only reason uh, for the brain's uh, raised ICP. So in these cases, we go straight for the decompressive hematoma, take the hematoma using an, a microscope, so quick in and quick out. Uh, so rather than uh, putting an endoscope and then wasting the time and then taking the patient for the second surgery or, or the decompressive hematoma. Well, uh, a small catch is that if in case we are doing an endoscopic hematoma evacuation and we see that the brain is still tense and it is not relaxing, so what we have done now is that we have a pediatric cardio probe, which have a very small footprint. And uh, so we just put it inside our butthole and try to scan the brain intraoperatively itself. So if in case we see that there is still some hematoma, we try to track that hematoma. If there is no hematoma seen, then before we, uh, we, uh, we can, we have two options. If the patient's uh, uh, conditions allow us to go for a CT scan, then we always go for a CT scan and take that decision uh, definitively. If in case the patient condition does not allow, then on the table itself, we convert it into a, a craniotomy or a wide uh, decompressive craniotomy, and uh, that's how we, we salvage that procedure. Uh, but then in my series, we did not have that. This is just a hypothetical situation, which I have I was just talking about, uh, because we always have to have a plan B and plan C ready if in case some certain eventualities come up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Your excellent tip uh, information. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Amitabha, um, may I ask maybe slightly out of the context of your endoscopy evacuation, do you use uh, urokinase or alteplase uh, to dissolve the clot? Any, any, any experience in using this? No, we have not used it in Nepal um, uh, for two reasons. One is that it's very difficult to counsel the patients that I'm going to put a tube and then uh, put a costly drug. Uh, the the, the these types of thrombolytic drugs uh, comes at a price here and uh, patients uh, usually do not consent uh, looking at the price so they go directly for the surgery rather than putting a tube and then waiting for three four days uh, for the clot to get lysed um, and then um, um, and that's one of the experiences which we had we, we did want to use it but then somehow uh, we did not find too much of acceptability in, in our patients Probably one question. Uh, thanks, Professor Amit, uh, for a very nice uh, presentation. I uh, wanted to ask uh, regarding thalamic bleed, uh, what would you do for the intraventricular portion of the? Will you put another endoscope and uh, clear the uh, hematoma or just an uh, EVD? Thank you. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's another good question. In fact, I did discuss about this in our presentation. Uh, so, what I did, well, I do in these cases is that I always make a trajectory which is 
which allows me to go inside the ventricle without taking the tube out. So what happens is whenever this, uh, these clots are going into the intraventricular space, the clot itself has made a conduit into, into the ventricle. So whenever we push in the water irrigation, the water irrigation actually makes it conduit much more bigger. So we do not have to push our endoscope through the brain tissue just after evacuating the hematoma and then trying to uh, wash the cavity, we can actually go inside the ventricle directly. And there we, we, we remove the, uh, any intraventricular clots, which is there. And then we just place this, the same uh, infrapidine tube, which we have drained, uh, been using to suck the things out by punching more holes onto the side walls. We leave that particular catheter inside uh, so that it can drain any remaining clots and, the, um, and also the bloodstream CSF can come through without. And we also use the same tube as the ICP monitoring device uh, in the post-op period. Just an extension from the same question. Say if the hydrocephalus is persistent and you need to change the tube, will you enter to the same point or you put the usual coaches point uh, ventricular catheter? Thank you. Oh, yeah. So usually if in case the patient does develop a hydrocephalus, then we do not use the same point. We use another point. Uh, for one simple reason, because uh, the tube had been there for for a few days and that may get infected, so we do not try to touch the same place uh, so as to avoid any chances of post-operative infections. Uh, so we make a new port. Thank you very much, Professor. Any other questions? If not, um, maybe we can uh, end the session tonight. So uh, we've been updated by Prof Subin uh, that there are 500 over people who have joined us on WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom. So it has been a very fruitful uh, session. So on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Prof Yoko Kato, I would like to thank both the speakers today, Prof Kumar Sura and Prof Tapa, as well as Prof uh, Ajif Nair for the time and support for the ACNS webinar. Special thanks to Prof Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Special thanks to my co-host, uh, Dr. Liu Bun Singh, for joining me today. So until we meet online next Saturday, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.